You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Try to spice it. Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today, I have my good friend, Dr. Shambo, coming in. Thank you very much for taking the time. Hello, hello. Thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, the popular podcast, Who Arted. I appreciate that I have a doctor here to join me and talk about the heart. (laughs) Um, We've got Jim Dine is our subject for this, and while I do say you know, the heart, he was not just the guy painting hearts, although that's probably what most people know him for. So Jim Dine was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, June 16th, 1935. His parents were second generation immigrants from Eastern Europe. Uh, And they owned a hardware store. Growing up in a family business, he's surrounded by tools, and that seemed to be a big influence on him. Throughout his career, we see a lot of emphasis on just that physical act of creation. So like in the 1960s, some of his earlier works, he was combining drawing with found objects, which is exactly what it sounds like things that he found, and he was showing tools and the process in his work. He literally showed the tools. He would attach a tool to the canvas. That's crazy. Wow. Um, Well, but it gets in line with what a lot of other people were doing. Like, I think Robert Rauschenberg and this idea of the combine and, um, you know, artists like Marcel Duchamp before that were making found object sculptures, combining all sorts of different things in... um, assemblages or assemblage, if you want to be fancy with it. I'll go fancy. (laughs) Uh, Can I uh, make this podcast about me just for one second? Always. Because this might be the only time you accept me on this podcast, so I got to go for it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I also had a father working uh, that owned a store, not a hardware store, a grocery store. Okay. So I grew up kind of similar background to Jim Dine and... I can stack some mean shelves in the meat aisle versus the soup aisle, but I know uh, all of the work that goes into owning a grocery store and why he would incorporate that into his life a little bit because it takes up a lot of your time in the family business. Yeah, because, you know, there's a difference between simply working in a store in your youth. Like I did I did my time stocking shelves and facing shelves right. and getting the, the labels facing correctly, but... You know, for me, that was X number of hours a week and then it was done. Whereas when it's the family business, it's it you take it home with you because how that store is doing makes a big difference. I got out of school and I was the stalker. Not stalker, but the st- the, you know what I'm saying. Stocking the yeah, shelves, stocking not, the shelf. not, not like following the yeah, customers home. I was home. not following the customers <laughs> unless they're doing naughty things. But um, And then I was the meat. Uh, I was uh, putting the meat into all of the packets. I was uh, making sure the money was right in the drawers. I was the everything guy. But that's the business you're in when your family owns the business. Yeah, and I think it's always interesting because when I first saw Jim Dine's work, I saw these tools, and I was taking a very shallow approach with it. Like, I hadn't done all that much research as, you know, a student in my first art history survey course. I just saw, like, oh, there's a tool attached to the canvas. You know, it's an artist thinking of the labor involved. But, you know, like so many things in art there's a lot more personal connections than I think people realize. And growing up in a hardware store, that made a huge difference. So um, if I was Jim Dine, I would be more like Warhol with going with soup cans because of my grocery (laughs) store. So I'm just throwing connections all over the place. But And I I love the connections you bring. Yeah. Um, And speaking of connections, I... I think you might have some more insight into this next bit than I do. Jim Dine was dyslexic. Yes. And I'm sure you've heard of that. Yes. Um, And so reading was a bit difficult for him. But like a lot of artists... He sort of persists. He finds a way to overcome those personal struggles. He found novels to be particularly difficult, but he had an easier time with poetry. Right. And one of the things I I always love is somebody who struggles with something but still perseveres perseveres and, and finds a passion for it in the way that they can be successful. And so Dine 
you know, has always apparently loved reading and writing poetry. Um, to my knowledge, he still does that. Yeah. And, um, you picked the right, um, person today because I'm also a first grade teacher and I, uh, see struggling first graders in my classroom and it's our job as first grade teachers to make sure that that child is meeting the needs or, or is that grade level of reading, if you will. Yeah, you got to find out right. what their need is and then figure out how to meet it. Dyslexia being one of those. There's so many things that um, hold a child back in reading or other areas. And I feel for Jim Dine because um, I was also a struggling reader as a child. And I did find passions in certain areas of literacy um, and poetry also being one of those, uh, coincidentally. Uh, and I remember um, in ninth grade or 10th grade, one of my English teachers had us memorize poems and I was not good at memorizing at all. Yeah. But um, I had to play on audio, me reading it out loud so I can hear myself do it so I can memorize it better. But I uh, I definitely um, make a connection to him because reading was not an easy thing for me as a child. And I make a connection to my children in my class, my yeah, my children in my classroom because I can see a little bit of their brains working harder at certain times, too. Absolutely. And I always think with the historical connection, you know, Jim Dine, born in 1935, that means that he is reading like in elementary school during World War II. Yeah. And I think about what was happening in, what were the trends in education back then? <laughs> it wasn't so much individualized <laughs> no. support and attention for nope. somebody who struggled with dyslexia, which was not always like, it was not always an apparent right. struggle that people had. Um, and so I always think about poetry was probably something that was easier for him to chunk, yep. you know, to, to, grasp um, smaller chunks and to get his brain around. And I think that's probably why he found his passion there. But I also think in some ways the school system was not always accommodating of people who had a different way of seeing and a different way of learning. Yeah. And I think that's probably why he gravitated towards and excelled in the arts. Yeah. And I, I feel for Jim, uh, because he grew up in an era before I did, I grew up in an era where they started meeting those needs. Not like we do today in education in the 2020s, but, um, I went through the education system in the 1980s and, um, it was getting there, but dyslexia wasn't a popular diagnosis or, you know, or accommodations, at least where I was at in America at that time. Well, and just, you know, over time, know better, do better. We find these yeah. better strategies of reaching and supporting those kids. But what I have found in studying so many artists' narratives, the common theme I'm noticing is somebody struggles with something and they find a way to be successful with the tools and the insights that they have. Yep. So novels weren't for him, but poetry was. The visual arts were something for him. He had that background and tools and he's putting that sort of biography into his work. And we see that throughout his, throughout his story. And now for the tragedy in our hero's journey, if I were to take like the Joseph Campbell dun, hero dun, with a thousand dun. faces type view of this. Now when he's 12 years old, his mother passed away and I, I just, I cannot fathom no. dealing with that as at, at that age, you know, as, as an adult, I would have a hard time with that. As a as an adolescent at twelve, that seems that's just such a fragile time in people's lives. It's big years, you, right there. You know, you're, teens. you're yeah, you're just starting to sort of find your way and form your own identity. And he says, largely, he had to take care of himself. And he attended high school and then went to art school. So like 1953 through 57, he's going to the Art Academy of Cincinnati. And he studied under Paul Chidelaw. Uh, he was an abstract expressionist painter. And when I think of Jim Dine, I really think of this combination of abstract expressionism with pop art. Like his work doesn't fit neatly into a certain category. And... So he wouldn't really be associated with a specific m movement per se, but 
I definitely see that sort of like painterly quality in his work. And just for listeners to understand what what I mean when I say painterly, we see evidence of that process of painting. We see the visible brush strokes, the the sort of sketchy lines and what what's often called like gestural movements where we see like the act of painting carried out laid out on the canvas. That was very well explained. I got exactly what you said from that. Thank you. I I try. Uh, you got to work hard at explaining it when we were doing visual arts in an audio medium. And but that, that's why you're the art teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So then after he's after he graduates from the Art Academy of Cincinnati, he gets married and he moves to New York. While in New York, he gets to know a lot of other prominent artists. Um, specifically, he seemed to get close to Klaus Oldenburg. Klaus Oldenburg was a a pop art sculptor. I think of him for like his soft sculptures of like giant hamburgers and stuff like that. But he's done a number of monumental works around the country. I think, um, you know, a classic example, a lot of people point to is a spoon bridge that he built in, um, Minnesota, if I recall correctly. So I have a question. Yeah. So during the fifties, let's not even do the fifties. Let's just, this is a general question. Um, would you say New York, just in America, and you can talk about globally also, yeah. but just in America, would you say since he moved there, was that the place to go for art? Yes. That, that, or is it still the place to be? You know, when I was in when I was in art school, like at the Art Institute of Chicago, I was always told like if you really want to make a career as a visual artist, you have to spend some time living in New York. Okay. Like that's still sort of the, the scene, um, because the art world, a lot of the people that are very successful seem to be friends with other people who are very successful. Like it's a group, it's, it's people who are supporting each other and learning from each other. And that's the, that's the place where a lot of them gravitate to, towards. And in the historical context, um, and I should point out, I'm talking largely about the Western art yeah. and Western um, civilization and Western culture. Because we're talking about Jim Dine right now. Because so. we're talking about Jim Dine, but also, you know, America and European artists, there's a lot of, a lot of interaction between them feeding off of each okay. other. And so, when we talk about Jim Dine, who was growing up and came out of art school in the 1950s, World War II, you might have heard of. Kind yeah, of, I think, yeah, yeah, I think I've heard that. Kind of had a big impact on the art world. Okay. Um, I see. I didn't know that. Yeah. I knew that um, a certain faction stole art during that time. Yes. Well, I didn't, uh, but I didn't know the impact of everything. Okay. So, well... <laughs> At the risk of going off on too much of a tangent, <laughs> right. but I absolutely love a good tangent. Yeah. Um, Hitler was a failed artist, yeah. and he absolutely hated that. the modernists. He hated modernism in general. He would hold it up for ridicule. And wow. um, so there was like the famous degenerate art show and all of that. And a lot of artists fled Europe because it was not a great place to be. If you were of certain ethnic okay. descents, you know, yep. obviously it was not a great place for, for Jewish artists, Correct. but also modernists were targeted in a lot of ways as well. Not, not being sent to the camps necessarily, but it was not a great place for them to be. I just learned something new today about world war two. Yeah. And so at that time, like pre-World War II, your standard like centers in Europe, you think, you know, Paris, London, um, Berlin, like a lot of cultures coming from there. But a lot of the cultural producers left Europe, came to America. Um, and so a lot of them were in New York and other places at that time. And so that was very influential and essentially like the center of the art world, at least in Western society, shifted to New York in the mid 20th century. I see. And so like, like I said, Jim Dine, Klaus Oldenburg, a bunch of other young artists at that time, they're supporting each other and they started to take part in what were called happenings, which was basically sort of performance art. And the idea was to focus on process and the experience of art and getting more sort of conceptual to a great extent. It was really largely a rejection of abstract expressionism. 
abstract expressionism, you might think of like Jackson Pollock, the drip paintings. That was the big movement in the scene in the mid 20th century. And of course, every young generation kind of takes their shots at the the generation that came before them. They they try to carve out a new identity by rebelling against what was popular in the previous generation. So that goes with art also? That goes with everything. <laughs> wow. Any sort of cult, like that's why fashion is cyclical. Yeah. Um, and so the Abex movement as I said was huge. Along these similar lines, you might say like you know, the erased de Kooning piece by Robert Rauschenberg, who was also a part of that young artist scene. Um, I covered erased de Kooning in a mini episode. So listeners might want to check out the erased masterpiece, but a lot of people interpret that as a rejection of sort of the supremacy of drawing and abstract expressionism in the art scene. And so Jim Dine is a part of that new scene coming up with, different ways of thinking of art right the performance the com- the combines those those things that you know incorporate found objects with like a little bit of sculpture a little bit of painting and drawing just trying to reinvent the wheel essentially all right i have i, I have two questions yeah sorry to in- interject but that's, that's why it's a dialogue yeah i uh two two things are on my mind right now Number one, when you say performance art, is he literally trying to get a crowd around him while he works on a painting in the middle of New York? Or what does that, what does performance art really mean? Performance art, literally the performance is the art. So you might make an argument that a play is performance right. art. You know, you're doing something. The happenings tended to be. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The happenings. Happenings tended to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more chaotic. Okay. <laughs> you know, a little bit more um, free spirited. I think if I you're know, thinking like, I think I know what you're if you're thinking like 50s, 60s kind yep. of stuff happening, um, I would say probably a good analog to that would be, um, you know, sort of flash mobs yep. in in um, right, uh, not quite current, but not too distant past. Um, I think of like improv everywhere. If you're familiar with them, they've done stuff where like, let's say somebody gets on, on the subway in their underwear. And then at the next stop, someone else gets on in their underwear and the next stop and the next stop. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the line, someone gets on giving out pants. Yep. And for those people who were <laughs> who happened to be on that subway train, like the world is suddenly a very surreal place yes. for about 10 minutes. Yes. And, you know, that's kind of the spirit of these happenings is to create an event, mm-hmm. an experience for people that takes them to another place that changes changes the reality for the moment. Right. So originally I was thinking a happening was like a, a Banksy, but that's not really what a happening is. No, no, no. It's not it's not strictly guerrilla art in the yeah. sense of putting something up where you're not supposed right. to. It's more it's more doing something with intention behind it to to create an experience right. or to convey some insights or you know try to uh, coax an epiphany from yeah. pe- people who um, happen to be in the area. Makes sense in my brain now. And so, like I said, he's experimenting with these different things at that time, and in 1962. Jim Dine participated in a groundbreaking show titled New Paintings of Common Objects. And I mean, with a hot title like that, you knew it had to be big. Um, This was generally considered to be the first pop art show in America. Uh, Even though Dine didn't consider himself to be a part of the pop art movement, he he liked the pop art movement and he was friends with a lot of pop artists. He didn't consider himself a pop artist per se, but he was in good company at that show. As I said, these great artists seem to work together a lot. He was with Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Ed Rusha. So a lot of people that would become extremely big names for decades to come. Is uh, Britney Spears included in the pop artists <laughs> category? <laughs> I mean, in, in some ways she really is. Like you, you could say she is, I mean, she is a pop artist. I always find it funny when we think of like 
pop culture artists. Yes. It's a little bit ridiculous the way somebody will say like, well, this screen print of a celebrity is fine art. And yet the photograph of a celebrity that the paparazzi take is, you know, garbage. Right. Like in, in some ways there is an absurd line being drawn yeah. and a lot of it is contextual mm-hmm. pop art largely is about getting us to pay more attention to those common things that we see so much. We don't even notice them anymore. You know, I just try to make a joke and you just made it into another lesson <laughs> and, and you did a great job doing that. And now it's like, wow, um, you open my eyes again. <laughs> well, but that's, I mean, that's part of the, the spirit of this show is I, part of the, the central thesis is we want to appreciate the art from all different artists from all different viewpoints. And so, you know, I've done episodes on okay, go just like I've done episodes on Warhol. Right. Um, it, it's all the act of creativity and all of that has something in it for us to appreciate. So he participates in the new paintings of common objects show, By the mid-1960s, which feels kind of fast to me, but he was pretty prominent on the global stage, I'd say within like a decade of getting out of art school. And he lived in London for a while, but 1970s, he comes back to America, decides to focus on drawing. And sort of it's at this time that he starts developing these recurring motifs that would come up throughout his career. Um, So we see he does stuff. He's best known for the hearts, Mm -hmm. but he does other stuff, paint palettes, bathrobes, all sorts of stuff that seem sort of common and mundane. But... We're going to focus on one of his heart pieces now. Uh, specifically, we're looking at the confetti heart number one. It was a lithograph from 1985. And I have dominated the conversation so much. I want to give you a chance to get a word in. What do you think of this piece? What's jumping out to you? Um, obviously, the heart. It's the prominent part of the the. What it draws you in, but there's kind of like a 3D feel to it to me personally. I mean, of course, there's a multitude of colors all around. Looks like he tried to get out every single paint tool he had and um, use it. Um, the black around the coloring. Um, there's kind of a darkness around, um, and this is just my interpretation. Yeah. Kind of like there's a darkness around, a, uh, but there's a world of color around the darkness. And it, it opens up the darkness kind of. That's just my interpretation. Do I know what he's trying to say with his, this piece? No. But does that jump out to me that there's colors, a little bit of darkness, and it's a little bit of 3D at the same time? Yeah, because the, the heavy outline around it and the way the that black sort of softens as it gets further away from it, creates a drop shadow effect. Yes. Whenever you outline something, it's going to have the effect of pulling it forward in the picture plane. So it does make it stand out. Like it does pull the heart forward away from that, the color in the background, even though we see essentially the same colors, the same marks, the same intensity of colors in both the heart and the space around it, that heavy outline helps to create that emphasis and pull it forward. Um, I find it interesting when I think about, and like you, I don't know specifically what he's going for in this. I mean, we see a heart and the heart could be the obvious symbol of love. I've, I've read that he used the heart to reference his wife and his relationship and, right. and all of that, which makes perfect sense. But there's something I really like about the heart as a symbol because, one, I like things that are positive. The older I get, the more I just don't have the time and energy to dedicate to things that bring me down. I like something that just I can look at and feel good about. Yep. Um, Even if that's a little bit, even if that's a little shallow or hedonistic, I just like things that are pretty and make me happy. (laughs) Yeah, Um, so do I. (laughs) (laughs) But then at at the same time, the heart's interesting because... It's such a simple symbol 
it gives you this basis for experimentation. Like when I think of Warhol and his series of Maryland prints and stuff like that, he had the same screen, the same stencil image, and then he experimented with painted backgrounds and stuff like that, different color combinations in there. In some ways, Jim Dine feels to me like he's doing the same sort of thing. He's taking this this simple symbol that's easy to reproduce, and he does it like 10,000 different ways. I have seen so many hearts from Jim Dine, and yet no two are the same. This one I pulled because it's so colorful. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, I, as somebody who, as somebody who was a painter in my background, I am always a fan of stuff where I can see the process. I can see every individual brush stroke. I like to look at works and sort of deconstruct, okay, like what was going on here? He's doing those layers, the bright colors, and then he puts the black over the top of that. We see, we see a little bit of splatter effect towards the heart. Um, and if you look at the, the top sort of left edge on sort of both, both, I don't know, mounds at the top of the heart, as well as that slant on, on the left side, we can see it's almost like a hatching technique or something. The, the black gets really dense right at the edge and then it spreads out and becomes less dense. We see more of the color showing through as it gets further away from the edge, which is again, sort of referencing the, it's sort of referencing the techniques that you might use in, a printmaking method. Can you, which, yeah. Can you explain the hatching method to me? Okay, so in really traditional printing, um, you might think of you've got the black of the ink and the white of the paper. Yes. Well, how do you create a gray? The way you, that you do it is by spacing out the black lines so that you see black, white alternating. Yes. And so you put more lines closer together and it becomes more dense in black in some areas and then spread them out so that it becomes less dense, more of the white showing through. And the eye okay. blends those together. So from a distance, you get that that effect of yes. shading that reminds me of those visual things you look at on one side uh, on the left side and then the right side and you have to put your hand up in the middle to really to realize they're the same thing yeah um you know they're gray or the same size do you know what i'm saying yeah. And, and, and it's, again, it's similar stuff where it's playing with the, the way that the eye perceives it. And to me, the way that like the black becomes more dense in, in what would be the darkest part of the shadow. And then it sort of just splatters out from there has this effect to me. It's almost like the abstract expressionist equivalent of the cross hatching we might see on like one of Durer's prints or, um, you know, something like that. It's like, it's this modern twist on some traditional methods. And I, I, as like sort of a formalist, someone who likes to look at the way things are constructed, I always find that interesting. I, I, I feel like it's a slightly different spin on something that is a familiar technique. Yeah, and I I noticed just because this is the level of art education I have, yeah. primary and uh, complementary colors, <laughs> that red and green are by each other a lot in here, complement complementing each other. Yes, and to put that into the formal art speak, we would say he's juxtaposing these complementary colors to heighten the contrast. Sounds like a dance, juxtaposing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you are right, when we put complementary or opposite colors next to each other, it does make them seem brighter because of the comparison that's drawn. The way we perceive color is always in relation to other things around it. And we do see throughout this, it's a lot of stuff that are opposites or near opposites kind of put together in each of those brush strokes. We see a warm color next to a cool color. Yes. Almost, almost every time. Um, and I, I think again, that's where he blurs the lines between that pop art of like the symbol that seems to be appropriated from pop culture with a little bit of his training from an abstract expressionist artist who was all about the gestural quality of the brushes and the splatters and the drips and the way that the colors would 
you know, radiate off of the canvas and the expressive qualities. And I, I think, you know, the heart we have to talk about, it's an expressive symbol. It is associated with that positivity and love. It's in some ways sort of personal. And yet at the same time, it's become totally generic and universal. And I, I think in looking at the heart in a painting, in that fine art gallery context, it makes me think about how that symbol can occupy different spaces and have different meanings for everybody. Yeah, you heard my like what I thought it symbolized to me right out of the gate. So, I mean, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But um, I do have a question, though. Yeah. The hardest art class I ever took was my bachelor's degree. So I have no formal training outside of my bachelor's degree. So I've always wanted... I have no formal training outside of my formal training. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I do want to know coming, uh, speaking to an artist uh, and speaking about this piece also, when do you know you're done? Like this looks like he's spent a multitude of layers, splattering, brush strokes. Does your heart say you're done? Well, I... Honestly, like it's it's something that on a very uh, for a lot of people like this it's it's a gut thing okay you look at it up close you look at it from a distance you look at it and y- you feel like can i see what i want to see in there do it does it feel like it meets my goals okay. for the piece you know um and I've never thought that deeply about my artwork. I was just trying to get an A in my class, you know, and, you know, my outlets more music and other f- forms of art. But so I've always wondered from a professional artist speaking about a professional artist. When, you know, with any creative piece, you know, you're done when you're happy with the result. Yeah, that's, you a, know? Good, that's a good way. If to put you're it. if you're dissatisfied and you see room for improvement and things you would like to change, then you're not done. It doesn't matter if the, if the canvas is covered or not, it's about the quality. And, you know, I look at this, the reason I would say this is done is because I look at it and I don't think it needs anything else. Yeah. It has what it needs and nothing else. So there's nothing I feel needs to be stripped out of it and nothing I feel that needs to be added to it. And that's, that's the mark of something that feels successfully completed. Makes sense to me. Yeah. But also for those who are studying art and want to understand how to know if something is finished, take a step back from it because it always looks different up close. You see every single detail, um, and all the subtle details, but from a distance, you you see it differently. And so artists are always encouraged to step back from their work when making those determinations. And I'm wrapping it up. I want it. just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Lou? Is this something to look at? The lab? the lab? Is this something to learn from? Or the Lou? British for the bathroom. Yeah. There's the a the Lou joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Is it wrong to say all three? And can I say why? There is why? no wrong. This, I mean, Jim Dine has a multitude of works all over the world. Yeah. We discussed that. So he definitely, this piece can speak to a lot of people in many ways in the Louvre. Yeah. Um, did I say that right? The Louvre? The Louvre? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the lab, it's, I, and personally, I just learned a lot from you and just looking at this, you can, this is a great teaching piece. I yeah. mean, and then would I mind seeing this while I go to the bathroom? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it puts me in a place of happiness. And, you know, you look at it, it puts you off. It, it puts your mind in a different place. And yeah. sometimes that's a good thing. Yeah. I, uh, so I can't answer it. I don't know. <laughs> there's no, there's nothing wrong with being un, unable to answer it. It's just, a it's just a device to provide closure to the episode yeah. and to, give us an opportunity for a summation. Right. Um, I, I kind of agree with you. I, I feel like, you know, just as he doesn't fit neatly into any specific movement, I feel like his work doesn't fit neatly into one of those categories for me. If I, if I were pressed, I would say I most closely go towards the lab. Yeah. Just because to me, 
a lot of his work, the repetition of this, of the same symbols and everything to me, it feels like a, it feels like an exercise in creativity. It feels like an artist's journey and a quest to figure out and experiment and do these different things. And maybe that's just the lens that I'm bringing to it because I do look at things I look at every work of art and think like, how was that made? How would I make it? How would I make it differently? Um, And with this piece, it feels like it is in some ways about that process. It's in some ways about the symbol and the associations with it. But to me, this feels like a creativity exercise. Yes. Which I'm all for. I, I, I love that. And I can see the argument for the museum piece because... I enjoy it as well as learn from it, but to me, it's mostly a learning experience. Looking, especially looking at his body of work more broadly, right? And uh, very timely, uh, being February, also. I appreciate that you saw what I did there. I, I, I know knew what you, you would. Did there. <laughs> uh, and so, thank you very much for taking the time, sharing not only your time but also your insights and your expertise into the art world, but also the learning process and the the biography, as we mentioned. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, always a pleasure talking to you in the teacher's lounge or on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted. If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.